Good afternoon. Thank you, Kelly, for that warm introduction. And I am so delighted to be here, as she said. Uh, it is not quite often that I'm able to uh, engage with an audience of engineers. I am most often engaging with teachers and administrators in the humanities uh, and particularly in the K-12 setting. So I am very excited about our workshop. It's very interactive. I'm going to have you doing a lot of things. Uh, you, I will certainly model for you what a classroom teacher does, particularly at the K-12 level. You will probably say, yep, she's a former K-12 teacher. And so I've got my folders for you and some nice handouts. And so we're going to get to work. We're going to get to work around this topic of cultural competence in STEM undergraduate teaching. Um, I want to make sure everybody has a folder. If you don't, we have several extras. So just raise your hand, and uh, Dr. Soto will get a folder to you. I prepared 50 folders, so I believe we do have enough. I am a walker, and I talk with my hands as well. So I'm going to try to control some of this you know, stuff like this uh, because I'm on video. But I will walk because it's a good teaching strategy not to stand behind the podium. So I don't typically do that. Uh, let me get right into our agenda for this afternoon because it's jam-packed. And it, it, most of you, I think, are teachers. You're instructors in the classroom. And, and so I'm sure there are times when you don't get through all the material. And so we might not get through all of it. I might have prepared too much for three hours, but we're going to get as far as we can. Uh, we're going to start out by looking at why focus on cultural competency in STEM in the first place. And then the role of self-reflection in becoming culturally competent. I don't believe we can actually talk about becoming uh, more culturally proficient educators if we're not willing to kind of do that introspective work, right? It's not only about understanding others, but understanding ourselves and how who we are shapes the work we do in classrooms. So we're going to do some self-reflection. And then we're going to look at theories for understanding the harmful effects of bias and discrimination for underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. And we'll round it out by looking at frameworks for inclusive teaching uh, in STEM undergraduate classrooms. And what's going to be really neat about it is I draw on frameworks that we've been using in K-12 education for a long time. So this idea of you know inclusive teaching and being culturally relevant isn't new to K-12. It's actually you know a little newer for higher ed. And so I'll be mapping some of those K-12 frameworks onto our work today, thinking about undergraduate teaching in your STEM classes. I need you to do a little exercise. I'm getting Buzz Lightyear to help me out here. Um, it's hard to sit for three hours, and so I want you to think about distractions that might come up in your mind while we're working together. And so I just want to give you a moment to pause and think about things that might interfere with your work this afternoon. Just give you a minute to think about them. I don't believe you came as a blank slate with nothing on your mind. And then I want you to take one of these index cards and write those things down. Write them down. I'm not collecting them. I don't want to know your business, but write down those things that might present themselves as a distraction. I'll give you a couple moments. And then as a symbol of placing those distractions aside for our time together this afternoon, I want you to put those in the middle of the table. Okay? You're, you're saying for these three hours, I'm going to put those distractions on hold and I'm going to try not to focus on them so I can focus on the work at hand. Because the reality is they'll still be there at 5 o'clock, right? So if you can focus for this time, we'll leave those there as a reminder that we've set them aside. 
Uh, all right, so let's go through our objectives and learner outcomes. I have five objectives for our time this afternoon. I am hoping that when you leave today, you'll have a better understanding of how your identity shapes your thoughts about teaching and learning and your interactions with culturally diverse students, culturally diverse learners. I'm also hoping that you'll understand some theoretical and conceptual frameworks that explain underrepresentation and underperformance of certain students in STEM fields. And particularly for our work today, we're talking about underrepresented racial ethnic minorities and women most specifically, okay? There are certainly other marginalized groups, but uh, most of my discourse will refer to those two groups. And then I want you to understand frameworks that really support cultural inclusivity and proficiency. A lot of understanding taking place this afternoon. And then some time for discussing strategies for then practicing inclusion, right? and hopefully we'll get to planning and action. But if we don't, my expectation is when you leave this conference, uh, whenever you're leaving, that you will engage in the planning and action process. Because it does us no good as educators to soak in the theories and concepts and all the information and dialogue with our colleagues and then not do anything to actually change our practice. So those are my objectives and learner outcomes for us. Given that, I think it's important that we understand the larger picture, right? If we're talking about working towards being more culturally competent instructors, what's that pie? What's the bigger picture? Again, for me, it's about who am I as the instructor in those classrooms? Who are my students? And I've kind of separated that piece out um, because we're thinking a lot about who are those underrepresented students? And then who are we as a classroom, right? As teacher and student. And if you think about that bigger picture, I like to see these as the three pieces of the pie. And as educators, we have to constantly be thinking about those three. Who am I? Who are the students? Who are we together in that learning space? And I forgot to add, um, I think you have in your packet, there's a hashtag STEM14 that you can use to tweet uh, during our time together this afternoon. Um, the other thing I'll say about that is it's good to use it in case you have questions that come up that we don't get to. I'll be able to go back and look at the Twitter feed and respond to those later. My own um, Twitter handle is ampersand Dr. Dorinda CA. So you'll be able to find that on Twitter as well. So in your folder, uh, it should be nicely in order. You have an activity that I'd like you to start with. And uh, it's a reflection activity. And it should give you these three questions. I want you to take that paper out and write in the blank space your responses to these three questions. The first being, I consider my biggest strengths working with culturally diverse students to be, and you finish that. Number two is about your challenges. And then the third one is really about you thinking about your own instructional practice and if you personally see it as culturally inclusive or not. Okay, this is a personal reflective exercise. So please, I'll give you a few moments to jot some answers to those. Oh, that's my little time, our time is up. Wonderful. Okay, now I'd like you to spend a couple moments in a pair and share. It seems like everyone has a partner. In some cases, you might have to do trios. But share at least one of your responses with a partner at your table. Please proceed. All right, if we can pull ourselves back together, that would be great. And let's take them one by one. Let me have a couple people share about what you heard or maybe what you wrote. 
Okay, related to the first question, I always like to start in the affirmative. So what about strengths working with culturally diverse students? Anybody want to share with us what you heard or what you wrote? Mm-hmm. Uh, opportunity to be a receptor as well as a deliverer of knowledge. So that's a great kind of pedagogical stance as well, too. This idea that you aren't the only expert in the classroom, right? That the students also bring knowledge and that you are a learner, too. Great. Yes. Was there another hand? Someone else? A strength, please. Just personal connection to everything when you're in that one-on-one -one situation with mm -hmm. the Yep, personal connections, listening, being an ally. Those are key words. Do you see yourself as an ally? Maybe one more. Someone else, strengths, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very important, respect, and he said as you know, human beings. I mean, one of the things I'm going to talk about in a little bit is how do we humanize our practice, right? Are there ways in which we instruct and relate that are actually dehumanizing and we don't actually realize it? So trying to be very humanizing in our work. Great, let's look at number two. What about some challenges? What did you hear? What did you write? Please, a couple of remarks. Yes. Okay, so I'll repeat what she said. That basically, that contextual barrier, right? Being from China, teaching in a U.S. context. So how does lack of understanding about the context present itself as a challenge to me? That's great. Someone else, please. I feel that, that the students begin to segregate themselves into mm -hmm. groups. Sure. Great. So the challenge of students um, always, you know, inclined to work with peers most like them. And how do I, as the instructor, kind of disrupt that? One more. Please. Mm -hmm. openly. So when I'm in these conversations, I'm a little uncomfortable bringing that to the table because it's not just about being diverse. It's okay. about how we see that diversity as it relates to STEM competence, STEM ability, yep. who's going to succeed, mm -hmm. not going to succeed. That's and great. those are the hard conversations yep. to really get into. Yep. Y'all, we're diverse. That's right. And that's great. I'm glad you raised that because we're going to have some of that difficult conversation today, right? And it's in our discomfort that we actually grow. I mean, that's where the discomfort is. So if you feel a little uncomfortable today, that's a good thing, right? You might not even like something I say, uh, or it just kind of rubs you the wrong way. But anytime we're talking about issues of culture, power, and difference, things can get a little uncomfortable. So I always like to say the space is a safe space, but it's a courageous space, right? Safety doesn't always mean comfortable. And so I want you to be okay sitting with your discomfort this afternoon. So I heard you talking about a challenge that's larger than your interpersonal relationships with students, but that's a challenge around the discourse in the field, and particular STEM largely, but also in computer science, because you all are computer science faculty, correct? For the, for the most part, okay. 
Um, we won't, I won't ask people to kind of raise their hands about number three. It's a, a self-check, you know, a pulse on yourself in terms of do I perceive myself as someone who is culturally inclusive already or I really don't. Either way, we all can grow in those areas. There's no, I've arrived at cultural competency, right? If you believe that you're a lifelong learner, then you're always engaging in this work. And there's never a point of arrival. Even the most, um, you know, even the person who's most effective at cross-cultural relationships still has more to learn. And so we'll leave those for, uh, another time, but why focus on cultural competency in STEM teaching? You all know this information, but I wanted to put it up there. Anyway, we know that racial minorities make up less than 5% of the STEM-based workforce. And while Asians are overrepresented as scientists and engineers, people from historically underrepresented groups, and that's a key term, historically underrepresented in the U.S. Students like African Americans, Latinos, American Indians, Alaska Natives continue to be underrepresented. Okay? And then when we think about gender, women made up only 28% of science and engineering workers just four years ago, almost five years ago. But there are benefits to having a diverse STEM workforce. And so this connects to your ability to teach effectively across cultural differences because we need people of diverse backgrounds in the STEM workforce. And so there are some of those um, benefits. They're listed by senior executives at the nation's Fortune 1000 companies. And so you can see some of those there. I mean, we know these things make sense. Even amongst yourself as faculty colleagues, there are benefits to having diverse colleagues. So it's important for us to understand that our teaching really shapes whether or not students decide to go into these fields both as uh, laborers in the larger workforce but also as future faculty, right? As future faculty as well. So we have to define some terms in our work together. I never assume that when I'm working with a group, we all are speaking the same language. And so we're using this term, culturally competent, culturally competent. Well, what is culture? Let's get a handle on that. Culture is generally this shared, learned, symbolic system of values, traditions, social and political relationships and worldviews that shape our perceptions and our interaction patterns in the world, okay? It's created, it's shared, it's transformed by a group of people who share these common characteristics, whether it's by, you know, a common history, a geographic location, common language, common economic status. Right? When we think about social class, we could probably, you know, list characteristics of the upper class in the U.S., the middle class, the working class. Those are cultural features that are shared, values, traditions, etc. Okay? It's good to think about this definition of culture because culture is broader than what people typically think. When you hear the word culture, most people think race or ethnicity, right? That's what most people initially think. But culture is larger than that, as that definition shows. And culture is created and recreated in the context of our everyday lives. So as STEM faculty, you share a common culture, right? But STEM faculty from Smith College share a different uh, set of cultural traditions, values, tastes, interaction patterns as faculty from UC Berkeley, et cetera. You follow what I'm saying? There are subcultures within cultures. As a woman, I share some common characteristics with other woman, women. But as an African-American woman, 
there are some cultural values, tr uh, taste, styles that are different from Latinas or Asian American women, et cetera. And then even as a black woman from the South, this is actually my hometown, there are cultural tastes and styles and traditions that are different from a black woman from Boston. Do you follow what I'm saying? So we can never be simplistic about culture. We can never define it simplistically because it's dynamic, it's not static. So then we think, well, what is competence, right? Competence is a pretty basic term. It implies having the capacity to function effectively, being proficient in something, being skilled. And so then we put those two terms together, cultural competence, we're really talking about a definition that the National Center for Cultural Competence has put together. And you may not have known there was a center for this, right? Uh, so I encourage you to go to their website. And they define cultural competence as this set of values, behaviors, attitudes, and practices within a system, an organization, a program, or among individuals. So today we're talking about how you can be culturally competent as an individual, but you're situated within a unit, which is situated within an orga organization, which is situated within a system, right? So how you uh, enact cultural competence as an individual is actually shaped by all those other cultural systems. It's very complex. But that cultural competence is this ability to honor and respect the beliefs, language, interpersonal styles, and behaviors of individuals and families that receive our services. Wow, that's a tall order for us as educators. And I have to say, in STEM, it's an even taller order, right, given the nature of the content of the material that you're teaching. This idea of honoring and respecting beliefs and language and inner persons, how do I even integrate that stuff into my instruction? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, experiences about their own discipline. So true. Even the use, I'm so glad this gentleman said that. Language itself is problematic. So his comment that to even use the term STEM and make general claims about um, STEM faculty, STEM disciplines is also, is equally problematic. Because within this broader umbrella of STEM are various entities right, of um, uh, t topical areas and expertise and knowledges. So I completely agree with you. We can't even simplify that. Language continues to be problematic uh, in our society. The National Center for Cultural Competence also gives us five mandates that they believe cultural competent organizations, programs, and individuals have. And that's on one of the handouts in your folder, just so you have these. But I want to read these aloud for your understanding. At the individual level, they're saying that as individuals, we should value diversity and similarities among people that we should understand and effectively respond to cultural differences. That we should engage in cultural self-assessment. That's that critical self-reflection I'm talking about. How often are you just self-assessing, right, about your ability to interact across cultural differences? And that if you're culturally competent, you make adaptations to the delivery of your services. You institutionalize cultural knowledge. In what ways do we integrate the knowledge of the variety of students that we teach into the institutional structure of what we're doing? Yes, please, sir. 
The previous slide, yeah. Uh, I'm having a little difficulty with the line that says the ability to honor and respect the beliefs. Okay. Um, what if the beliefs I'm encountering, um, I would consider, let's say, you know, something. Well, if I encounter someone, uh, somebody's racist belief, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do I have to honor and respect that? I think that's a great question. I do not think that that is what the definition means, right? We have to honor and respect beliefs that actually affirm people's humanity, not okay. deteriorate it. So I'm glad you uh, mentioned that. Uh, the, the idea around honoring and respecting beliefs is not to honor and respect beliefs that are oppressive, that are harmful, that marginalize, that disenfranchise. Okay? Great Thank you. question. Mm -hmm. So now, let's do a little bit more critical self reflection. And I want you to think about uh, this is not in your handout, and I see some people taking pictures, but I believe there are four critical questions that you need to be asking yourself as an educator all the time if you're working towards cultural competency. How does who I am shape what I believe about teaching and learning and my actual instructional practices? In what areas do I need to learn more about culture, power? I'm thinking about this woman's comment here, right? Because it's not just about kumbaya, we all have unique differences. That's, we're going to get into some of that. There are issues of power wrapped up in cultural difference. Uh, privilege. What accountability measures are in place for me to grow my cultural competency? Personally, do I have a critical friend that I'm always speaking with, right, that's keeping me accountable to do what I said I'm going to do around learning more and acting differently. And then how am I planning and implementing strategies for effectively teaching all learners? What you see in the book, I, I tried to best represent this as possible as a process. It's a process. There are no arrows, you know, in terms of directions for things. But as long as you're working toward cultural competency, you're trying to increase your understanding of yourself, your cultural understanding of self, your awareness and understanding of social inequities, right, in society. Um, you're, an, you're examining your beliefs about teaching and learning all the time, doing self-checks, and then ultimately, hopefully, you're improving your instructional practice. Any comments or thoughts about this? This is a framework that I don't care what discipline you're in, I believe it's important for you to engage in this continual process as someone who says, I'm trying to be more culturally competent. There's a author, Alan Johnson, who says the trouble around difference isn't just that people are different from one another. The trouble is that society is organized in ways that encourage people to use difference to include or exclude, reward or punish, credit or discredit, elevate or oppress, and value or devalue. It's so true. We are all different in this room. But society has placed value on our differences. And some people's differences are more privileged, more advantaged than others. And that societal structure informs the way education works the way teaching and learning works. And because you've been socialized in that system, you consciously or unconsciously uh, interact with people based on how you value or devalue their differences. Do you follow me? My hope is that we're all, always doing the words in green, right? But the reality is we're human beings, and sometimes we oppress. We discredit. 
we exclude as, as educators and we punish. And we have to be asking ourselves, why did we make those moves? Why did I make that move in a classroom? Why did I interact with a student in that way? We all bring a cultural backpack to the teaching and learning process. And each of our backpacks has something different in it. So inherently, there's going to be cultural conflict in the classroom because we're not bringing the same lived experiences. And we're bringing different value assessments of our differences. Do you follow me? That makes it hard to teach a cross-cultural difference. I mean, you know, th these are buzzwords, but this is what makes it hard. I'm not saying it's easy. And so I ask you, what are your lenses? What's in your backpack? What have you learned about race, language, social class, gender, sexuality? What are you bringing to the classroom in your backpack about religion, about ability differences? This is part of that ongoing self-assessment where you say, how does what I've learned and come to know about these things shape the way I teach and interact with students? Thoughts about that? Any comments? Yes? I've worked on some of the other areas here and learned things, but in ability, um, I have to fight not mm. to label students A student, B student, C student. Yeah. I have to fight not to treat them differently in the way I respond to their work. Mm. So I'm glad ability is up there. I'm so glad you said, I, first of all, I appreciate her honesty, right? That's a challenge that you're naming. And so often as educators, we link uh, somebody unconsciously, right? This is that implicit bias stuff. We don't intend to do these things, but the way they speak, we make an automatic assumption about ability. The way they dress, we make an automatic assumption about ability. Um, their age, their social class, Right, and you don't even know you're doing it, but you link those misinformed uh, assumptions or claims to what they're capable of doing in a classroom. And that's why you have to have accountability measures in place so somebody can check you and say, uh, you know, wh wait, let's talk about why you did that or why did you say that to that student? Is it connected? to some misinformed stereotype or assumption you have based on how you've been socialized in society. And oftentimes, we just make a fixed you know, statement about a student's academic uh, intellectual capacity based on you know, our, our misinformed stereotypes and assumptions and biases, and even if uh, the, the stereotypes come from somewhere, right? They come from us seeing, you know, people of various groups uh, behave in certain ways in society. The problem is when we use those to generalize an entire subgroup. Please. Yes, I did, um, what about uh, I think I think disability? Adding yeah. to that also. Did yeah, part that? of this ability is about cognitive. Uh, physical, emotional, right? How much do you know about your students' emotional stability? So sometimes their performance in your classroom is about emotional ability. So thinking about ability along those various dimensions, not just physical, but cognitive, uh, mental, uh, you know, emotional, uh, and especially in STEM-related disciplines, if you're an uh, underrepresented student, there is so, the research shows there's so much going on. And if you're at a PWI, 
a predominantly white institution, you're trying to negotiate so much that faculty aren't even thinking about that affects your uh, physical, um, you know, stamina, your emotional stamina, um, and that then links to your ability to perform at high levels in the classroom. Uh, yes, here and here. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was sitting in on a technical writing class not too long ago because you have to observe other teachers sure. sometimes. And uh, the class was um, all people from Korea. Okay. And then um, there was one or two students that I guess they were finishing up their degree that maybe were around 50. Mm -hmm. And then when the other students came in, they would bow to that person and like okay. show extra respect. Okay. Okay. And then like those two people seem to have like an elevated status and I noticed on your one slide mm -hmm. you said elevating mm -hmm. people so even in the classroom there was some people that even though everybody's a student that sure. some people had like a, a higher status uh -huh. than others mm -hmm. and and did you get any information about um, culturally where that comes from where it emanates from anything about well, I, I was I was told after a class that the, those two people were very successful mm -hmm. business people in the community, okay. what people looked up to, but also because of age. Age. And mm -hmm. then um, some Asian cultures um, respect the elderly mm -hmm. a lot more mm -hmm. than maybe we do in the United States. Sure. And so those kinds of so you him gaining understanding about that cultural difference c may. Uh, play a part in shaping the way in which he interacts with students of that particular subgroup in his classroom, right? He can't generalize that to all Asians, you know, from the continent, but for that particular subgroup, that's why understanding cultural nuances is important for our interactions. I know in the K-12 setting, for some Asian American cultures, looking in the eye is disrespectful, right? But in our Western way of interacting, you are expected to look a person in the eye when you're having a conversation with them. There are many K-12 teachers who have shunned certain students. You know, they see that as a sign of disrespect. Why won't they look at me when I'm talking to you? Because culturally, that is not the way it's done. Right? And so we have to understand these cultural differences so that we don't make value judgments that then play out in how we assess our students, uh, interact with them, right? Um, instruct them, provide opportunities to them. Sometimes we will um, restrict opportunities based on our assumptions about how we think someone interacted with us. And that's based on a lack of cultural understanding. Uh, yes, sir, please. So I, I want to shift the frame a little bit from, okay. from misinformed to underinformed. Okay. And you know the you know the the, the challenge that um, I think we all have is uh, around the logistics of creating the time and space yeah. to find out about one another. Yes, that's a dilemma. Yeah. Because we have so much to cover yeah. in so little time. Yeah. Some of our classes are really large. And so, you know, I would put that out there as yeah. how do we build that into our courses? Mm -hmm. Not just for us to find out about our students, but for our students to find out about us. Exactly. No, it's a great uh, question. I anticipated that that would come up, right? Where is there time to do this kind of cultural work? Where's the time? Online. You could do it online, but again, we're assuming people have time outside of the work day to do the work, right? I mean, again, I'm not making judgments, but this is a very valid question around where's the time? I think a second question that often comes up is, is this valued, right? I've got to be assessed by someone. 
So, I mean, I understand these things as a faculty member. While I'm over here trying to build my cultural competency, I could have been, you know, writing an article, writing a research grant. I mean, this is real stuff that faculty contend with, right? But I say that to say if you are committed to this kind of social justice teaching, you have to make the time. People do it. They find the time and still meet the benchmarks that we as faculty have to meet. Um, so it's not easy, but it can be done. As you raise that question, I thought about something else, another purpose for the index cards. If you think of something as we're going throughout the day that you're like, you know, I'm not sure I want to ask that question out loud, but I want to put it on the index card, please do that because I'll be collecting those as well from the table, whether it's a question or a comment. I forgot about you. Please go ahead. So having taught outside the U.S. at an institution where females were a majority in computer science, okay. which is the opposite here, wow. coming here, you, you have a perception of how to try to be inclusive, right? Okay, yep. And I think that you, as an educator, you grow over the years. You do. And mm -hmm. you, you know your students, because I'm coming from an institution where the classrooms are very small, mm -hmm. 20 in a computer science class. Wow. So you get to know your students. So okay. you try to be inclusive, mm -hmm. but it's a challenge, yeah. right? You know, yeah. you spend time outside the classroom and you try to spend some time inside the classroom mm -hmm. to understand your students, mm -hmm. but it's a huge undertaking. It is a huge yes. undertaking. I mean, faculty have various ways they um, do this. You know, maybe once a semester or a quarter, you know, they have a, you know, lunch with Dr. So-and-so. I mean, there are various ways you can create informal space for you and your students to connect on a level that actually allows them to see you as more human. I mean, most undergrads just see you as the professor, that, that you don't have a life outside of that, right? And so how do you build relationship and rapport beyond the confines of the actual classroom? Maybe it's, again, once a semester, um, lunch with Dr. So-and-so. Uh, and if they can come, they can come. And you do it again the next semester. I do a lot of emailing with individuals. I can write an email in three or four minutes, just checking in on you. I notice I pay attention to students' behavior in class. Body language can tell you a lot. And so I'll just shoot a quick email after class. I notice, you know, you looked a little concerned today in class or, you know, but again, you, you've got to be attentive to that kind of thing in your teaching. You can't be so um, content and technically focused that you're not teaching to the whole person. The whole person. We have to learn to teach to the whole person. So we have to work through these cultural differences. And here what I'm trying to get you to see is that as the teacher, we bring certain norms, values, beliefs, expectations, interaction styles, and ways of knowing to the classroom, but so do our students. And when those interact, you know, stuff happens in the intersection. We don't just have biases, stereotypes, and assumptions. They do too. That's why it's so important to create the space for rapport building, because they've got some assumptions about you that then make it hard for you to teach them. And especially if they're underrepresented minorities uh, ethnically, uh, there's certainly, you know, I'm sorry for our um, international faculty, their assumptions about you when they come in the room. If you're a white male, there's certainly, you are like the prototype of what an engineer is. I mean, think about, you know, there have been studies about this in K-12 where teachers ask kids, draw a picture of a scientist. It's always, in most cases, a white male in a lab coat. From childhood, somewhere, kids get that perception. It's never a woman. 
it's rarely a person of color unless they have someone in their family who's a scientist, right? So they're socialized very young to have a certain picture of who can be, who is, and wow, that's not me. That's just not me. So they're coming to you with some assumptions about who you are. Yes, sir. I was going to reiterate what she just said, uh, knowing the fact that uh, our classes are so diverse. You know, mm -hmm. you have you have students from different countries, students from different backgrounds, yeah. di students from different you know ethnic groups, and yep. so on and so forth. Now, in our case, do we look at? Do we take the majority and then focus on the the, the culture of the majority in your class rather than on individual basis because that's a big challenge for yes, a lot is. of faculty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so what would be your recommendation? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's always, oftentimes you hear people say, teach to the metal, right? Think about the bell curve and just teach to the average student. You're going to have some who are, you know, highly excelling and others who are really behind the eight ball, but just try to teach to the average group. Uh, you know, it is, I don't think in any instructional period we can reach every learner. We just can't. I think what's important is for us to understand, is to make clear our expectations for students, number one. Are those expectations clear? Um, and if they understand the expectations, are we committed to helping all of the students as best we can reach those expectations, right? Understanding that some, they're walking in there, they, they know how to get there on their own. They bring the social and cultural capital with them to the classroom to do well. But then we have the recognition that there are other students who just don't bring the capital, right? Um, the U.S. type capital. I, it, you know, it's a U.S. capital. And our international students may not bring it. And some of our domestic students from underrepresented groups don't bring it. They didn't get it in high school, even if they were the valedictorian at their school, right? Well, but being valedictorian where they were is very different from being valedictorian at the school across town. Their curricular preparation was quite different. So another way to think about this is the varying types of capital that students are, first of all, I believe they're bringing capital. You got to believe that. They're bringing capital, but it may not be the dominant capital that's needed to succeed in the environment. And so then for you as the educator, you have to say, how do I make clear um, the expectations for learning the dominant capital? And then how do I give students the skills to acquire it? Do you know what I mean? And so in that way, you're not going to reach everybody, every class, every semester. But if you frame it around clear expectations about what that mainstream set of skills is, and I'm going to do the best I can to help all of you acquire those skills with an understanding that you're all bringing something. I may not understand what you bring, but I'm going to try to learn it. Then you're working towards being uh, more effective cross-culturally.